Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another in their exciting new series of broadcasts on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Each week, Hallmark will bring you true-to-life stories of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Presented on the Hallmark Hall of Fame by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. On this Easter Sunday, it seems particularly appropriate to dedicate the Hallmark of Fame to the memory of a great woman who devoted her life to the resurrection of hope in countless thousands of human lives. I'm speaking of Catherine Mumford Booth, who, together with her gallant husband, William Booth, founded one of the world's greatest humanitarian organizations, the Salvation Army. To tell this true and inspiring story, we must look across the Atlantic to the nation which first fostered so many of our own ideals of social freedom and Christian charity, to England. The England of Catherine and William Booth. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, let the hallmark on the back be your guide. For that hallmark tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical Small Town Girls, starring Jane Powell and Farley Granger. And now, here is Lionel Barrymore with the first act of your Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is a story of adventure. Adventure in the truest and highest meaning of the word. The adventure of the soul. It's the story of a woman and of the man she loved. Her pen glides swiftly across the paper, and then presently she pauses and and gazes through the open window, a window which looks out upon an English garden, a garden lovely with lilac and lavender, as lovely in its way as is Catherine Mumford in hers. And then her pen returns to the letter. Letter dated June 1852. I know how you must feel, William, and that you must be patient. You must not lose heart. It may be that England is not yet ready for your work. Or rather, it may be that you are not yet ready. But the time will come. It will surely come. You must believe that, my darling. As firmly and as fervently as I believe in you. The time will come, yes. But what is this work in which Catherine Mumford believes with all her soul? Let us turn back three years to 1849 and the city of London. The London far removed from pomp and circumstance. The London of squalid streets and shabby hotels. The the abiding place of fishmongers and ironmongers and and chimney sweeps and, and hungry urchins. Here it is that young William Booth lives and works. Lad, homesick for his native Nottingham, England. A a, a lad of high ideals, drudging through the days as a clerk in a pawn shop. A pewter teapot. Mm -hmm. Now, how much do you want for it, sir? All I can get, Governor. And much that'll be, Lord Lummy. I believe your name is, is Pumphrey, isn't it? You were in here last week. And if I was. Oh, you told me you needed money for your wife, and yet when you left here, you went straight to the alehouse. 
I watched you. Now then, now then. No blooming sermons. How much for the teapot? Six shillings. If you'll promise to take the money home to your wife. <laughs> if I promise. The old lady's left. Just nothing to remind me of her but this blooming pot. And now the, the six shillings, if, if you please. And then it's back to the alehouse, I suppose. Do you know a better place? Oh, Mr. Pumphrey, a man cannot live without some thought of the future, some hope for a better life. <laughs> yes, perhaps the workhouse or debtor's prison. Ah, they'll catch us all soon enough. No, all roads do not lead downward. God hasn't put us here to destroy ourselves. He needs us to be happy and to do his work. Do we now? Mister, if there is a gourd, I'll lay a tenner. He ain't losing no sleep over old Daddy Pumphrey. Well, now, how can you know? Have you ever prayed to him? I said no preaching, ye. Yeah? Now, do I do I get me six shilling, or do I speak to Mr. Baskin about you? Then perhaps he'll be looking for another clerk. Much obliged to you, Reverend. Yes, that's where you belong, Sonny. Get yourself a blooming pulpit. Oh, perhaps I shall, Mr. Pumphrey. And if I do, you'll be the subject of my first sermon. Idle words, no indeed. For the young clerk in that dismal pawn shop has already begun his studies for the ministry. Finally, he's accepted, and the day arrives when the Reverend William Booth gives his maiden sermon. Afterwards, there's a tea at the home of the, one of the church overseers. A tea at which William's first sermon is hotly debated by the host and a girl with flashing eyes and a determined chin. Of course his sermon was upsetting. He intended it to be. Isn't it time that we were shocked out of our smugness and... My dear Miss Mumford, you seem to forget that the poor are always with us. We do not need Reverend Booth to remind us of the conditions in our slum area. In other words, Mr. Jowett, you'd be trying to tell you only comfortable things. It's far more pleasant to be asked to contribute money for a stained glass window than to give baskets of food to the poor. It's always unpleasant to think of poverty and disease and crime. Social reform is the problem of Her Majesty's government, Miss Mumford. Would you have us interfere in politics? I'd have us be Christian, sir. Excuse me, Miss Mumford. I'd help those who do not believe in God to believe in their fellow men. When they have faith in their brothers, they will have faith in their father. Uh, Miss Mumford, how is it that you know so much about the conditions of the slums? Well, I don't. But if you're suggesting that Reverend Booth gave us an exaggerated picture... Oh! <laughs> oh, dear me. <laughs> but you are. Yes, I am, Reverend Booth. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Excuse me. Well, you know, such a spirited defense should be rewarded. Uh, perhaps another cup of tea. Oh, thank you, yes. <laughs> Mr. Jowett, will you excuse us? No, of course, of course. I did enjoy your sermon, Reverend Booth. And yet, I have one criticism. And what is that? You didn't go far enough. The poor need more than baskets of food. It's wrong to reach down to them. We should go among them, sharing their burdens. There should be a church for them and among them. Amazing. Extraordinary. What is? You. Miss Mumford, I hope that I shall see you often. Well, I'm just visiting in London. My home is in Brixton. I still say, I hope I shall see you often. <laughs> Often? Yes. Whenever William can, he journeys to Brixton. And when that isn't possible, there are letters. Letters by the score. And then one day, William comes again, and he and Catherine walk through the garden of lilac and lavender. Oh, you're troubled, William. What is it? No, oh, nothing. And everything. Everything? You must know what it is, Cathy. I've wanted for so long to tell you what is in my heart, and yet I feel I have no right to. No right? Oh, William, who has no right? But don't you see, my dear, you could have your choice of any of a dozen men, men with money and position. A minister with my salary has so little to offer. And yet so much, so very much more than anyone else in the world could give me. Your love and yours alone. 
Kathy. That's all I'll ever want, my darling. To be with you and to help you. Oh, William, there's so much for you to do. For us to do. Together. And so begins the lifelong partnership of Catherine and William Booth. In the year following their marriage, a son is born, Bramwell, and then a daughter, Evangeline. The Evangeline Booth still remembered with such affection and admiration by countless thousands of Americans. But that is still of the future. Now the year is 1861. It's late evening, and in the hallway of their modest quarters, Catherine helps her husband out of his fog-soaked top coat. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. I, I thought the meeting would never end. You poor dear. You must be exhausted. Yes, I am. And yet, I suppose, I should be exhilarated. William! They've given you the new ministry. I have offered it to me. I had supposed I imagine many other men would envy. And yet... And yet... It will take you even farther away from the things you want to do. Yes. When do you have to tell them your decision? Tomorrow. Oh, that's not much time. No. Oh, Catherine. Darling, take my arm. I want to show you something. Kathy. Shh. You wake them. But this is what makes it so hard. That we have the chance to give our children security. Look at their faces, my dear. Do you see any insecurity there? Do they look as if they wanted for anything? But what about those thousands of other children tonight? Unloved, sleeping in doorways, clothed in rags, hungry and perhaps sick. Children who will never grow up as Bramwell and Evangeline will. Children who will become godless men and women. Walked in body and soul, discouraged, defeated, and even criminal. You've tried to help them, William, but you've been too limited by your ministry. Kathy, if you're really willing... You know I am, my dear. Ever since we've been married, we've talked and dreamed of a mission for the poor and the outcast. This is the time. Yes. It will mean work and sacrifice... Perhaps even abuse and ridicule. I'm not afraid, William. And I know you're not. Because if God be with us, who can be against us? In just a moment, we return to the second act of our true story of Catherine Mumford Booth. Are you familiar with the wonderful custom of May Day as it was practiced in the early years of our country? It seems that the pilgrim children were encouraged to weave lovely baskets from grass and to leave them on the doorsteps of their dearest friends. A May basket found at the door was a welcome surprise where it meant, I like you, I want to wish you joy. Well, today, May baskets are back again. Yes, mothers and teachers everywhere are discovering Hallmark May baskets at the fine stores where Hallmark cards are sold. They're as pretty and colorful as spring flowers, and best of all, the youngsters can put them together by hand. Hallmark May baskets require no glue or scissors, so they're sure to give boys and girls hours of safe, pleasant amusement. And think what fun your little folks will have delivering their Hallmark May baskets on May Day. The cost is low, just 50 cents for a set of five different May baskets. Just look for the hallmark and crown on the package. The symbol you always want on your cards when you care enough to send the very best. And now here is Lionel Barrymore with the second act of your Hallmark Hall of Fame. The loneliness of the human spirit Despair and suffering, poverty and, and disease, these are the enemies against which Catherine and William Booth are to do battle. The years pass swiftly, years in which Catherine is wife and mother and social reformer, years in which Catherine and William found the Christian mission in the Whitechapel district of London. And then, one stormy winter's night, Catherine's returning to the mission 
There's a figure of a man huddled in the mission doorway. Spare a copper, ma'am. A copper, please. Oh, oh my dear man, you mustn't stand out here in the rain. Anything you can spare, ma'am. A copper, poor cripple. Oh, come inside, please. Me? Yes, quickly. You ain't, you, you ain't turning me in, not to the police? Oh, no. I'm going to give you some dry clothing. What for? Well, to keep you from freezing to death. Yes, and then some hot food and a place to sleep. What for? What for? My dear man. Nobody's doing all this for old Larry. You blooming well want something. Only for you to come to prayer meeting to read the scriptures. William? Yes, my dear. Will you come here, please? Let me go. Let me go. Turn me <laughs> loose. <laughs> Perhaps you can make him understand. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, my friend. This is the Christian mission. No, Lummy. It's him. What? Oh, you wouldn't be remembering me, sir. Not old Harry Pumphrey. Uh, the pawn shop. The man who was so sure God had forgotten him. Well, sit down, Harry. This is your home for as long as you need it. But my, my own? Oh, blimey. If there's people like you, there must be a God. Later that night, after the homeless derelict's been fed and put to bed in the mission dormitory, Catherine and William faced the unpleasant truth. Not enough people know about us, Kathy. The, the people who need us most, like, like poor old Harry Pumphrey, they've never heard of the Christian mission. Or if they have, they're afraid of it. They're like outcast dogs, afraid to come near, but they're of a stone or a kick. Well, if only we could make them understand. We could if we had more money and people to help us. But it's too much for us to do alone, Kathy. We're trying to win a battle that calls for money by the thousands of pounds and help us by the hundreds. A whole army of them. Yes, it's like a war, isn't it? A war against man's oldest enemy. William. That's our answer. What is? When there's a war, doesn't the government recruit an army? Yeah. The call goes out for queen and country. Let's do the same. An army for God and salvation. An army for God and salvation. Oh, William, don't you see? Every man or woman who has been helped by our mission can be recruited into our army. We can do it, darling. We will. <laughs> And so is born the idea of the Salvation Army with William Booth, its first general. It is to be truly the church militant with ranks and regulations patterned after the British Army. On street corners, in public squares, in Hyde Park, wherever people listen, a squad of uniformed men and women begin to speak words of hope to the hopeless. But victory isn't yet. There are other gatherings and rival speakers. Who is this man that calls himself General Booth? What's he collecting all his money for, huh? The poor? No, it's for himself. He's getting rich, I tell you. And his army, that is. Maybe you don't know what that's for. Well, it's to protect him from the law. He aims to be bigger and stronger than the law. That's it. He's a swindler. Oh, but we'll stop him, won't we, then? Don't be downhearted, my dear. How can I help but be? To be called a thief, a, a rabble-rouser, the exploiter of the helpless, to, to be turned against by the men and women we're working for. I know, darling. But we must be brave and patient. After all, stones are cast only at the fruitful tree. Hmm. Thank you, Kathy. For what? Or for so many things that I can never put into words for just... Being you. For a while, it seems that the dream of Catherine and William Booth will be destroyed. Salvation Army workers are attacked by hoodlums. There are riots and imprisonments, and, and then the climax comes. General Booth and his wife are speaking to a crowd in downtown London. Thieves! Swindlers! Go back to your son! Friends! Friends! Please! Wait! Why do you condemn 
famous for going about the Lord's business. Come on, that's right. Oh, the mob surges forward. And then suddenly it wavers. The carriage is drawn up beside the curb. A coach bearing the royal coat of arms upon its door. William, it's... It's the Prince of Wales. The crowd falls back as the prince makes his way to the side of William and Catherine Booth. He turns and faces the onlookers. Is this the way Englishmen treat one another? For shame. Let it never be said that Englishmen fear to follow in our Lord's footsteps, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to bring cheer to the homeless. All this General and Mrs. Booth have done. It is my hope and my desire that they shall continue their noble work without hindrance. The Salvation Army is your army and mine, and may it grow and prosper and reach out unto every Christian land of our globe. The turmoil and strife are over, and now, on a summer's day in the year 1880, an Atlantic steamer pulls away from the Liverpool dock. On the pier, Catherine and General William Booth wave their last farewell. Why, it's hard to believe, isn't it, Cathy? The Salvation Army's first foreign mission. Yes. And yet this is only the beginning. First the United States, and Canada, and Australia, and India. Wherever there is the need, we must be ready to serve. Yes. Only the beginning. Cathy. Cathy, do you remember when it really was the beginning? Well, the night you decided to give up the ministry... To start our first mission? No. No, even before that. The day we met. The tea party after my first sermon. Everything began then. Because of you. And I knew in my heart that with you by my side, all things were possible. Yes, I remember. That's the real secret of life. Everything begins with love. When love comes into the heart... And charity goes out to the forgotten. That's the new beginning. The beginning of life. The resurrection into eternal life. Catherine and William Booth's love and charity for all humanity have continued to this day to be the guiding forces of the great organization which they founded. Following in the footsteps of her mother and father, Evangeline Booth became the first commander of the Salvation Army in America and received from President Woodrow Wilson and a grateful nation the Distinguished Service Medal for her army's gallant relief of suffering during the First World War. In peace and in war, the Salvation Army, through its 17,000 branches in 96 countries, continues to wage ceaseless battle against human despair and misery. And now, before giving you a preview of next week's show, here's Frank Goss, who seems to have a little touch of spring fever. Yes, now that April is here, many of us are looking forward to the special occasions that come with a bright new season. Vacations are on the way, uh, weddings are in the offing, and boys and girls will soon be graduating from high schools and colleges across the land. All this means that you'll be writing frequent notes to friends and relatives during the next few months. And that's why I want to suggest that you prepare for spring by choosing several boxes of Hallmark note paper the next time you shop. You'll find a beautiful new collection at one of the fine stores where Hallmark cards are sold. Notes that are pleasing to the eye and correct down to the last detail. There are flower designs as gay as a tulip garden and casual notes with a touch of humor about them. Yes, and you can choose Hallmark notes for the youngsters, too. Amusing designs that will encourage the little folks to write to their friends. You can be sure of it. The familiar Hallmark and crown on the back of each Hallmark note you mail will carry an extra measure of warmth. For it means you carry enough to send the very best. 
And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Spring hangs her infant blossoms on the trees, rocked in the cradle of the western breeze. <laughs> That's an old saying of Cowper's. Guess I caught some of your spring fever, Frank. <laughs> but you know, besides heralding all the weddings and, and graduations and, and vacations to come, spring also brings the start of another happy event, the gardening season. It's amazing what satisfaction you can get from such downright hard work as gardening. And what wonderful friendships can start in a garden. Why, I knew a young couple who lived in an apartment on the north side of Chicago. It was one of those city apartments where you don't even know the neighbor across the hall. Well, one spring, this young couple started a garden in an empty lot near the apartment. Soon, other tenants in the building joined them, and eventually, the whole lot blossomed out in a mass of flowers and fresh fruits and vegetables. And, well... There's a building on that lot now. The gardens are gone. But the friendships that grew there are still going strong. Yes, sir, uh, spring is a friendly time. And a time to think of our friends. Well, <laughs> say, I better tell you about the person we're honoring next Sunday on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. As our tribute to the great American sport of baseball, which opens another major league season next week. Hallmark Hall of Fame will honor the father of baseball. You know who he was? Henry Chadwick. Be sure to be listening. Our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. Our producer, director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our cast tonight included Lorene Tuttle as Catherine Mumford Booth, with Ben Wright as William, Tudor Owen as Harry, Ted DeCorsia as the Prince of Wales, and Whitfield Connor. On Sunday afternoon, April 26, there will be a special Hallmark Hall of Fame program. Hallmark cards will present Mr. Maurice Evans, in his two-hour television production of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Consult your paper for time and channel. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time, when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who in their own way have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor the father of baseball, Henry Chadwick, on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.